dear guests, dear minister, dear clowns, it's an honor and a genuine pleasure for me to be here with you today. And I look forward to sharing our work experiences on the implementation of policies in the field of gender equality. The clowns said here in the beginning, we always need to move forward. And we are discussing it here today. What is the best way to move quicker forward than we have done before? And it's also a pleasure for me because it's the first time I come to Estonia and to Tallinn as well. <laughs> the Nordic countries represent one of the most gender equal labor markets in the world. Moreover, in all the Nordic countries, less Finland, the increase in women's employment accounted for about 10 to 20 percent of GDP per capita growth over the last 40 to 50 years. In Finland, it was less because the labor market participation of women was already high even as early as the 1970s. Across Europe, however, women remain consider considerably underrepresented, not only in decision making, but also in the labor market, where overall employment rate of women is still lower than of men, despite higher educational attainment. Women are also more likely than men to take on part-time job because of caring responsibilities at home. The challenge women have in balancing between work and care is confirmed by the findings of recent poll done by the, by the Thomson Reuters Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, which found that work-life balance concerns women the most followed by the gender pay gap. Harassment in the workplace with about 33% of women respondent reporting sexual harassment, equal career opportunities, and impact of having children on their careers. In Iceland, as well as in other Nordic countries, the conditions for gender equality did not develop by its own accord. The increment, in, incremental pro progress can be attributed to the hard working and working of the women's movement, eventually creating political will for the state and the social partners to invest in a social infrastructure of gender equality, which consists of four key pillars the women's movement had been ad advocating for. These are universal and affordable daycare, paid and shared par parental leave, equal opportunities at work, and for increased leadership of women at all levels, and lastly, flexible work arrangements to create conditions for work-life balance. These pillars are combined with universal health care, a strong social protection system, and access to education. Despite being successful, we still have space for improvements. In the Nordic countries, like elsewhere, it continues to be more common for women to discontinue their participation in the labor market for a longer period than men while taking parental leave or taking care of seriously ill or, or uh, dependent relatives. These gendered trends tend to have negative implications for the work career and the salary level of women in the long run, resulting in less income and later in lower pension benefits calculated on previous earnings. The unadjusted pay, gender pay gap varies from about 6% in Denmark to 18% in Finland for full-time employees. The gender pay gap can partly be attributed to the deep-rooted gender segregation in the labor market and a society where traditional women's jobs are still less valued comp compared to men's jobs. This trend continues despite the high educational attainments among, among women and, the fact, uh, and that fact is a part of patriarchal structures we share worldwide. We all know that we must overcome gender-based social norms and gender stereotypes which are deeply rooted in our societies. To bridge the gender pay gap and encourage women to participate actively in the labor market. We also know it will take time. In Iceland, for instance, the gender pay gap has continued despite prohibition, prohibition of gender discrimination in pay by law since 1961 and legal avenues to challenge such allied discrimination. 
One of the key reasons for its continuation has been the difficulty of employees to challenge discrimination in pay because of the burden of proof which is challenged by unclear job description and, and, and secrecy around salaries. Because of the apparent inability or unwillingness to eliminate the gender pay gap, a political will was generated in 2007 to consider ways towards, towards eliminating the gap. Subsequently, an equal pay standard was developed over a period of four years, from 2008 to 2012, in collaboration between the state and the social partners, and with technical support of the national standards body of Iceland. The key element of the standard is a classification of all jobs within a workplace by the same criteria, followed by the ranking into jobs of the same or equal value and then linking between the outcomes of the job classification and the salary structure. Subsequently, staff performing the same job or two different jobs ranked equal in value will get the same salary. After being developed, the standard was tested by several public, several public and private entities. The pilot of the standard often revealed gender discrimination in pay and various trends that employers were not aware of or conscious of until after applying the standard. Many who considered themselves to be fair employers were taken by surprise. The implications of the use of the standard for the employees was more trust in the senior management and better workplace moral as staff knew that they were treated equally. The use of the equal pay standard was voluntary until 1st of January this year when equal pay certification on its basis became mandatory, mandatory by law in Iceland. This law was voted in the favour of a large majority, not least because it was based on negotiated consensus between the state and the social partners. In practice, this means that the Icelandic government is taking an affirmative action to eliminate the gender pay gap by 2022, as the law makes the use of the equal pay standards mandatory for all workplaces in Iceland with 25 staff or more on annual basis. And we will start on the biggest companies or then, then moving down and it will take about four years to uh, fully implement it. As such, the new law const constitutes a tool to help us to fulfill decades-old obligations, rising from our own legislation from 1961, prohibiting gender discrimination in pay and international obligations on equal pay for work of equal value, such as the ILO Convention number 100 in 1951, the most member states of UN have signed. In conclusion, getting to the question posed to me by the organizers of uh, this conference, asking if compulsion and regulations are required to bring about significant social change or if there is another way, my answer, and I think the answer of the most Icelandic politicians would be, uh, yes, it is required. A number of legislative and special measures has helped us make progress. It is not just a coincidence. Legislation can be a very effective tool in subverting traditional roles in society, and that it is increasingly understood that both men and women can perform well in roles and tasks that traditionally have belonged to the other gender. Besides gender equality legislations, we also use tools as uh, gender mainstreaming and budgeting. And at time resorting to special measures like quotas on company boards with 50 staff or more with the aim to speed up progress in certain areas. Such measures have often been met with some resistance only to be proven successful and sometimes even popular for all involved. The best case in point is the individual and non-transferable paternity leave that grants men the exclusive right to take three months of parental leave with the first two years of their child. Increased engagement of fathers as care caregivers uh, has in turn brought normative changes 
to the notion of masculinities among the population and brought the gender equality debate more and more to mainstream politics and policy making, as, op as opposed on the margins where it often res resides. Uh, and to add to the paternity leave that uh, uh, it's often, if you look at old grandfathers, when they start taking care of their grandchildren, then they start saying, oh, I should have done it with my kids on earlier when I was young. And that is what the paternity leave, non-transferable, changed in Iceland. Then the father were forced to uh, take more part of the, of the care giving. The result is that Iceland has been the front runner on the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index for the last nine years. We still have a long way to go and are eager to reach further, not only because gender equality is a matter of justice, but also because we know it's a matter of necessity in terms of sustaining strong welfare policies and economic prosperity in our country. At the same time, as we are proud world champions of gender equality, we also understand that the title carries with it a lot of responsibility. Those we try to be good role models share lessons learned, collaborate with others, and contribute to continuous progress in Iceland, as well as worldwide, by means of our international engagement and development cooperation. We also use every opportunity to point out that gender gap index does not measure sexual violence, harassment, or other related issues. It is nonetheless obvious that sexual violence and gender-based harassment is a global problem that also thrives in Iceland. The sovereignty of women's bodies is being challenged around the world as the Me Too movement has demonstrated. Since it gained traction last year, millions of women have used the hashtag on social media across the world. Anonymously or not, women have revealed epidemic levels of harassment, violence, and everyday sexism. In some countries, the impact of Me Too has been minimal, while in others, the movement has led to a robust review of structural, structural uh, inequalities with specific sectors or in society at large. The impact of Me Too has been sig significantly different amongst the Nordic countries, which normally rank high on gender equality indexes. The whole Icelandic society was shaken by the Me Too revolution. Events, dialogue, media, and the reactions of the Icelandic authorities uh, reflect this. Only a few days after the first Me Too confessions appeared, the government presented various actions, work groups, and ministerial committee on equal rights was formed, and actions were taken by the women movement, and many men and boys joined forces with them. Around 15 groups of women stepped forth with stories and appeals, and more than 5,500 women signed a petition protesting violence and calling for changes. Me Too women in Iceland decided the naming and shaming of the offenders should not be a priority, even though some women choose to step forth and give back the shame to their perpetrators. The movement's more general focus has been on criticizing and tackling a deep cultural structure and a negative masculine culture that have fostered and tolerated violent behavior for centuries and makes it more difficult for women than men to succeed and to participate equ equally in positions of power. Powers means, power means many things in the world of Me Too. It certainly means empowering women to tell their stories openly and fearlessly but it should also signify our power to challenge and change the structures of society rather than changing women. I hope that last year will be the remembered as a milestone in our common struggle for gender equality and against sexual violence that is an everyday reality to many women. And the Parliament of Iceland uh, took a whole day where MPs from all the parties came together and held a special barbershop where they discussed the Me Too movement and discussed how gender equality uh, had uh, been uh, affected by them in their whole life. Uh, it was a strange feeling sitting there with MPs that have been in, the, uh, in Parliament for 30 years. 
uh, telling stories about their mothers, about their daughters, and uh, other, other, uh, other things. Uh, and I certainly think that changed a lot of how, how the MPs uh, uh, think on these matters. Dear guests, my government puts gender equality as a high political priority on its agenda. Next year, when Iceland holds the presidency in the Nordic Council of Ministers, we will host a large international conference on Me Too in Reykjavik. There, activists, sc scholars and policymakers will discuss the movement and its impact on women's equality in the Nordic countries and beyond, and reflect on how governments, businesses and organizations have and should respond. We would be very pleased to welcome all of you to the conference, which is taking place in September next year. Well, enough from me now. I'm very pleased to be with you here and for what I hope will be a very good discussion on this very important topic for the benefit of both women, men, girls and boys. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the day. Thank you for this. Uh, uh, let's uh, first uh, set one fact straight. We in Estonia have this complex. We think we are a very small country. Uh, we have 1.3 million of inhabitants. So can you please say it out loud, how many people live in Iceland? We have around 350,000. Thank you. <laughs> there is finally somebody who's smaller than us. <laughs> it's good. It's a moment of joy. But it's also good to be small, because then it's uh, possible to make changes faster. And that is a positive thing as well. So you should look at it as a positive thing. We actually are. Yeah. I was just a little bit teasing here. <laughs> but uh, I, I do agree that it's uh, so much more easier actually to make the change happen because mm. if you have 40 million or 100 million people, it's uh, so much more uh, difficult mm. that way. But uh, uh, going back to your speech, I just uh, wanted to ask you, you were saying that uh, Mm, the civil society and women, uh, women kind of put pressure on to the political agenda so that they would uh, finally acknowledge the fact that this is a problem and you need to deal with that. How did they do that? Uh, well, that, w that has been done through a long time with, uh, with uh, demonstrations. A uh, big milestone was when women started their own political party. Uh, that uh, were running for parliament in all, all constituencies, and uh, that forced, uh, that made a big, big, big change as well. So there are certain milestones that uh, are all based on uh, the women coming together uh, uh, and using their power because they have the power. And they were heard. They were heard. H yeah. how, how many years it took before they were heard? Well, we have milestones all over, and, and uh, I think I think the I think when they started their own political party, that was a that was a huge milestone. Very interesting. But um, so let's uh, now imagine that I'm a CEO of a company who that has like let's say 50 uh, people working, and now there comes a situation that somebody realizes I don't pay equal salaries, then what happens to me? Do you have sanctions for that? In Iceland? Yes. Yeah, after the, uh, well, the equal pay standard was a voluntary standard until 1st of January. Uh, and now we are implementing it for, for the company. So we're starting on the biggest companies. So in four years' time, all companies have, uh, need to have implemented the standard and uh, you need a certification. It's just like a regular, regular ISO standard. You need a certification that shows that you're paying equally to men and women. And if you're not doing it, you will not get a certification. And uh, based on the new laws, you can be fined on a daily basis if you not do it. Wow. I, I, I really, honestly, it's, it's mm. really hard for me to imagine that such thing would actually be uh, in legislation and happening in Estonia. But uh, with 300,000 people and 50 years of uh, women pressing the issue, uh, I guess it really proves it can be done. Yeah, I think you have to just... Uh, my vision is that you have to use the legislation. You have to push this forward. It doesn't come automatically from the sky. And uh, what we did with the equal pay standard is that we started it on a voluntary basis, 
got some big companies and uh, government institutions as well to implement it on a voluntary basis. And uh, the experience that uh, the CEOs uh, and general manager of these uh, companies and institutions were so happy with the implementation that they were actually the best advertisement. But are there uh, people uh, who are not happy with this? Of course, there's always, and it's probably the same in Estonia as in all over the world. Every time a government is coming forward with a legislation that somehow f makes forces the uh, social partners to do something, there's always some voices. But as I said in my speech, there was a big major majority in the parliament, only a few, only a few MPs voted against it to implement, uh, to make it mandatory. Uh, so, so there is always uh, some against, but it's very low and, and they don't have, uh, everyone working towards the same direction now. It feels a little bit like fairy tale to me. So does anybody have a question? Uh, or maybe you two there uh, want to comment something? No? Yes, on a, on a no, last yes. row. There's yes, somebody yes, yes, over here. Yes, yes, go, yes, go, 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 go. go, go, go. Yes. I saw a person putting a hat I up. can't see, but... Was it you? No. no. Oh, it, it, yeah, she was catching a fly. Or something. Oh, right. <laughs> but it's okay to ask now, because that's the moment for asking. Yes. Next but time you need to travel to Iceland to get an answer yes, from the yes. minister. Just, just be brave. No, oh, there, yes. there, 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 there. Yes, there. yes. Can you please also st 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 can you please stand up also, so we can see who's talking. Go, go on the other side. Yes, okay, okay, yes. okay. Uh, and now, uh, and you don't have to catch yes. it. Yes, oh, and I give it to you. All right, thank you. Um, Keep it close. I'm, I'm Ilvi Cannon from the Women's Centre in Dallin. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, when uh, the financial crash of 2008 occurred, Iceland had a spectacular experience of financial how can I say it? The one commentator said that it was no longer a country but a hedge fund. And uh, given the uh, leadership, how much did that affect the, the, the gender question politically in your country? <laughs> I think it affected everyone in the country. Uh, I don't have a feeling that it uh, affected uh, the gender equality issues more than other sectors. It, ju it just affected everyone. And uh, as you have seen, after the financial crisis, we have taken uh, big steps uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to the, e the equal pay standard. So, so, uh, so yeah, I don't think that uh, that affected the gender equality issues because there's always been, a, uh, not always, in the last years, there's been a good political will in all parties to, to work on gender equality issues. And, uh, and when, the bank, uh, when the bank crisis came, uh, there were no step backwards regarding that. No, no significant steps, no. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody who would like to ask? Yes, 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 uh, based on gender, do you also collect data based on uh, disability and also disability and gender? And is there any difference? And how is your Icelandic uh, perspective to that? Well, we, uh, we collect data on disability, and, uh, but we, we're not focusing, focusing specifically on disability and gender equality. Uh, and, uh, but there has been a uh, a discussion over the last years that that we should focus more on that because uh, uh, women with disabilities uh, are often in very hard positions and and we have been focusing on it for the last years but but there's no there's nothing big i can uh, tell you about that thank you so i, I will take the last question if i'm allowed yes i'll bring you the mic oh, I Okay, fine, fine, fine. Bring oh, it to you me. You have it, all right. <laughs> Thank you. So, Estonia has a female president now, and uh, 
I know uh, Icelandic presidential elections last time were uh, rather interesting when you almost, almost could have had also a female president, Halla Thomas Dottir was, mm -hmm. uh, was a candidate there and it was totally unexpected. Uh, so uh, I was just uh, interested that is it common for Iceland uh, to have uh, more women in politics and also as a public faces? Mm -hmm. Well, I was, I was just, while you put up the numbers here in the beginning, I was writing down for Iceland as well. And, and in the last parliamentary election, we had uh, 38... Pr pr now, in the parliament today, there's 38% women in, 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 in the parliament. And it actually decreased a little bit uh, in the last election. So we always have to stay on our toes when it comes to this. And all the parties... Uh, more or less have some uh, methods to have gender quotas, either gender quotas or certain rules that in each party you should have so many male and, and female. And in the, in the government that I'm part of, we are 11 ministers and uh, there are five uh, women and six men. So, so it, it could be it's similar yeah. to the chairs. You have we one need chair. one <laughs> neutral chair, but it's almost 50 percent so thank so and it's yes thank you very much i think our time is up and uh, thanks for coming here thank you thank you thank you, thank you.